So welcome everybody to the Martin Siegel Theatre Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is uh, Frank Henschke, I'm the Director of Programs and Executive Director. And, and as I said in my earlier introduction, uh, we do many events in the year, they're all significant, but I feel that the Japan Playwright Project is really an exceptional one. We have worked for a year and a half to make that happen. Aya came over and said, Frank, it's time to do something again. And I really would like to thank Aya again, not only for translating, but also for co-producing and making this all happen and being a bridge between two, uh, two significant uh, 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 cultures of theater and it should happen much more and we are always stand in honor that it's our little Siegel Theater Center. We always think there should be at the public or Lincoln Center here or there, but um, it does not always happen that, that way, but we hope it will be um, inspiring to, uh, to, to the New York scene. These are significant writers, very important writers, um, within um, the Japanese theater, which is one of the great, great traditions of theater in the world. And it's a great honor, and again, we would like to thank the Japan Foundation to make that happen. And we have three of the representatives here, and, uh, and uh, Sani, and uh, Koji, and Kenji Matsumoto. So it's a really great honor. And again, thank you for um, 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 seeing the importance of it and supporting it. Lots of people do see it, but when it comes to making things happen, it's much more complicated, so it's an extraordinary Event. We had our first reading in the afternoon, uh, Kavionas Fruitless Fable was a brilliant reading as to start, and I also know what we're going to see now is a very significant uh, uh, um, uh, a reading of a play um, from um, Jun Tsutsui, who is here with us. <laughs> and like uh, the other players, they really flew in from Japan to be here and to hear, to listen to the New York readings, to be actors, and hopefully also make connections. It's a fantastic thing. So really, thank you for taking out uh, your time and also for, for uh, writing um, that uh, play. 
Soko Naizu and uh, Soraya, the great actress uh, and uh, director who was very close to the Living Theater and uh, she um, uh, agreed to, to do this. So we want to also thank uh, Soraya for doing this. Um, if you have your cell phone out, I should do the same. Just take it out for a moment and make sure it's off. I'll do the same. So um, thank you very much. Again, after the third reading tonight, there will be a reception in the archive by round here on 36th Street. You uh, have the information here. Um, so um, I hope you will be able to join us. And um, Soraya, maybe a few words from you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Soraya Bruki. Uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, uh, it's been such an honor to work on this play and joy, it's hard to say joy because it's quite a significant moment that's happening in Japan. Um, but uh, I, I felt very connected and uh, I, so did the cast as well, even though some of the cast uh, are from all from different regions. Um, and so it's been a multicultural experience working on this piece as well. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce Sokonazu by Jun Tsutsui. Somehow hear that through the gap, through the draft, is cold. If, if you turn to this direction, innocent people who go there to toll the bell, their tangling footsteps resounding in the room, empty of expectation. But I guess I'm believing. I'm throwing these words because I'm believing, but I don't know what I'm believing in. The toll. Can you hear that? You can't? An ambulance's siren, disturbing. They are carried through the gap between the buildings to the hospital. They don't know how much they have drunk. Stumbling footsteps resounding in me. My stomach emptied of expectation. By the way, has the new year come? Not yet? That's it. The work is done. Throw this thing into it and it's done. As I talked with officer of the city office, 
electricity and gas in this room seems to have been cut off recently. That's it. The work is done. Today. This must have been delivered by the enforcer. Here. That letter has been sent. If they would read the letter. Throw this thing into it and it's done. Yes, certainly they will. As I told officer. So I believe that. Of the city office. Here. I told him. Here at this desk. Neither of the sisters ever. Have waited for the response for a long time. Reply. It must have been delivered by the enforcer. To our call recently. That letter. This. That's it. The work is done. If they would read the letter. This. But sorry. Here. I'm so sorry. Throw this thing into it. All the time. I've waited all the time. And it's done. Sorry. I'm so sorry. At the desk where I've been waiting. Officer of the city office. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Told me to deliver the letter anyway. All this time. Just deliver it. I've been waiting. The electricity and gas in this room. I'm sorry. Recently, it seems. I'm so sorry. To have been cut off. I've waited all the time. This room here. I've been waiting at this desk. Recently, it seems. Sorry. I'm so sorry. The electricity and gas. Electricity and gas. Have been cut off. Seems to have been cut off. Those sisters. Again, today. Even if we call on them. Enforcer must have delivered. The sisters never reply to our call, apparently. That, that letter. I wish they would read the letter. Electricity and gas. Then we can deal with it. Throw this thing into it. This. Just deliver the letter. At this desk. That's it. The work is done. I've been waiting. This letter. The enforcer is delivering. I'm just leaving the letter here, actually. That letter. As long as the officer doesn't mind. I wish they would read it. There's nothing else. I'm sorry. I would do. I'm so sorry. The toll. Are you able to hear that? You aren't? Anyway, whichever direction you turn to, you feel the draft. Disturbing desires, no one knows how many there are, resounding in me, my head, deprived of the ability to expect. But I guess I'm believing. I'm throwing these words because I'm believing. But I don't know what I'm believing in. The toll. You hear that? You don't? Can you hear that? You can't? Are you able to hear that? You aren't? Something resounds in my stomach that is empty. By the way, has the new year come? Not yet. Has it? Well, not yet. <coughs> it's a bit complicated, but don't worry. Everybody is the same. Everyone is in the same situation. The bank said you'd be super rich if you planted a magic seed bound to a crop like a dream in this vast land that your parents had. So the land's value got super high. Right? Right? When the value of the land was the highest, your parents suddenly passed away. And the government told you that a rule is a rule. As a duty of a citizen, as the heirs of a land, and to redistribute the wealth the government imposed a loan on you that was equal to the value of the land. It's complicated, but don't worry. Everybody is the same. Everybody is concerned equally. As for this land of your parents, everybody realized 
that the magic seed bound to a crop like a dream that the bank offered was a complete fabrication. And the value of your parents' land suddenly fell. However, for the government, who overlooked the bank's fabrication for raising the value of your parents' land, the rule was the rule. You inherited the land when it was the most valuable, so you have to pay it at the highest rate. Even though you value the place, selling it was out of the question. The value was too low, and it wouldn't have helped at all. Just trust me, and everything will be fine. Everything is the same. Everybody has the same idea. I have a clever plan that assures a steady crop and helps you maintain this vast land that your parents cultivated, though it is not super profitable. Build a good apartment complex, which is beautiful, right? Right? Which is superb and of high quality. On this land of your parents, you can live a steady life, inheriting and maintaining the land that your parents left your parents, who raised you and made you such decent persons. So build an excellent apartment complex on this land and pay the loan with the income from that. You don't really understand, but don't worry. Everybody is the same. Everybody does the same thing. If you let us build a high-grade, good apartment complex on this land of yours, you, their noble daughters, will be able to pay the loans steadily and monthly with the income from the rent. Right. Your parents in heaven must be happy that you can maintain the beloved land that is full of good memories until you two pass away. You will need to use all the income to pay the loans. You should manage on your own about the living costs. We can't take care of you that much. By the way, sister, what have you been doing next to me? You haven't made a single move for a long time. Incidentally, but what difference would it make if I cared? Do you want me to leave you alone? It's been very cold. Shall I put something on, like, like a futon on you? How do you want me to have it done? By the way, sister, you've been doing next to me. You've never moved at all for quite a while. For instance, if I called you, what would happen? Would you turn to me? If I called you from, from here to, to there, and then, for instance, if you didn't make a move, what would happen? What would that mean? If I called to you, and then nothing in this room moved, If I called to you and then nothing in this world changed, what would that mean? Well, what would that mean? <clears throat> By the way, sister, have you been doing anything at all next to me? If I called from you from here, well, wait, do I still have a voice? For instance, if I spoke aloud, what would happen? What would it mean? Well, to speak aloud, after all, what am I supposed to produce? A voice or try to say vocal training? What difference would it make if I prepared as an actor, after all? What would it mean? By the way, sister, have you been going on 
at all next to me? Hard to say. Vocal training. Well, am I still capable of speaking aloud? For instance, what would it mean if I couldn't even make a sound? What would that mean? What if my voice didn't reach there, even if I produced a bit of voice? Or voice that you didn't hear that? What would that mean? If my voice didn't make a sound and nothing in this room moved, if my voice didn't make a sound and nothing in this world changed, there? Or here? Either? Might there or here either be so? Either way, I don't know what if to do if with my voiceless voice I made, well, a sound and then nothing happened, so I can't make a voice. Enforcer must have delivered it again today. I wish they would read the letter. Yes, certainly they will, so I believe that. Having waited for the response on the phone for a long time, I wish they would read the letter that enforcer must have delivered. I've waited all the time. I'm sorry. So sorry. Sorry, I'm so sorry. That's it. This year is done. Throw this thing into it, and it's done. For a phone call, I've been waiting all the time. I've waited all the time. The last year, we went to Disneyland. A precious promise to my dear family. A dreamland for everyone, completely spotless. The souvenir was Mickey Cookie. Be careful not to drop the crumbs. I've waited all the time, but sorry. I'm so sorry. That's it. This year is done. Throw this thing into it. That's my job. Sorry. I'm so sorry. For a phone call, I've been waiting. Officer told me to take a police officer with me. It's easy to say, but maybe not yet, I thought. It seems the garbage has been stinking. Sorry, I'm so sorry. I told them that it's been cut off, electricity and gas. Enforcer must have delivered it again today. I wish they would read the letter. Through this mail slot on the door into which I throw this thing, the smell of garbage is coming out. I told them that electricity and gas have been cut off. The smell of garbage is coming out through the gap in the door. That's it. This year is done. Throw this thing into it and it's done. Then we can deal with electricity and gas. This new year will be welcomed to Okinawa, a precious promise to my dear family. The blue of the sea, the clear skies, can't believe it's in the same country. So, for a phone call, here I have been waiting all the time. The souvenir should be the Suko cookie, of course. Be careful not to go. I wish they would read the letter that Enforcer must have delivered. Sorry. I've been so sorry all the time. I don't get it. This ungrounded sensation. The land that our parents have cultivated, the property, our bodies, I don't really get what has happened to them. I don't get it. This unidentified sensation, the land that our parents had maintained, the property, our lives, I don't really get what has happened to them. I don't get it. I don't get it, really. The land that we have inherited.
inherited from our parents, the property, our values. I don't really get what has happened to them. We always spend New Year's Eve like this. How do you spend it? Again on New Year's Eve, <laughs> rubbishy young boys are singing of love and dreams on TV. Oh, I don't want to watch it at all. I, I'm not interested in it, but my husband says we never watch it if we didn't watch it tonight. So he means he's too busy usually. So I watch it with him together, reluctantly. <laughs> oh, but watching it, I realize that these young boys these days, though I don't know them at all, all these TV people, oh, but they're kind of cute. I gradually come to think eating noodles, yes, they are cute. These young boys these days, though it's just because it's New Year's Eve, probably. We always spend New Year's Eve like this. How do you spend it? The faces appear to be identical at first, but watching them in the TV show, oh, I come to think, Boy, he's cute. That boy's cool. This one's good at dancing. This one is funny. Though it's just because I don't have anything else to do, probably. <laughs> While well, watching it, my husband gets bored by the young boy's performance on TV. Oh? And says, This guy is stupid, arrogant. Or that guy, though he's dancing triumphantly in spite of the look, he must be a slow runner. We always spend New Year's Eve like this. How do you spend it? And then finally, my husband always says, that guy must be virgin to the TV. Oh, he doesn't know sex. He's a virgin brat. And I say, still young. But my husband says, that serves you right dogmatically and triumphantly. That guy doesn't know what real fun is, he says, to the TV that delivers songs about love and dreams. Oh, and while saying that, he messes with me. <laughs> he pokes me in the shoulders, in the legs, in the ribs, in various parts of my body, and he keeps doing that, actually. We always spend New Year's Eve like this. How do you spend it? While doing that, he talks about things. Whispering as if excusing, and I don't really know if it's true or not. Oh, he says, God made humans mortal because humans like to make new humans. They enjoy that very much. They enjoy making new humans so much that even God can't handle it anymore. So he has no choice but to thin out humans. Otherwise, there'd be too many humans and they'd destroy the world. Eventually. <laughs> we always spend New Year's Eve like this. How do you spend it? There is a reason for suddenly speaking like this. Again, on New Year's Eve, I'm dead like this and don't have a sense of time. Rubbish young boys are singing of love and dreams on TV. I'm dead like this and don't have the sense of time. Oh, out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> dead, and my body decays like this, which articulates time. But I can't read time since I'm dead. But I know that that isn't about time. That I haven't changed at all. And I accept my husband's messing. <laughs> because it's New Year's Eve. Relax. I don't know that that means
brings to this moment, this time of place since I've been dead and lost the timeline. I don't know what speaking like this without reading the air means since I'm dead. Sorry if I've been interfering with time. If I've been interfering with time, I'm sorry because I know I could have been, though I'm not dying for pardon because I'm dead. Sorry for having lost the timeline. I don't know to whom I'm speaking like this since I'm dead, and my narration might be unreasonable and incommunicable, but since I'm dead, words come out of me. I suddenly find myself dead like this, and no one can take care of my feeble sister. So I hope that my sister finds a way to take care of herself. Sister. But I have been dead, doing nothing, having done nothing here. Electricity and gas have been cut off. It is cold and we are worried. We recommend you to consult the city office about your living conditions. Before ending up like this, for example, the man who faithfully delivers the letter to us had seriously listened to me. I had had him listen to me. I don't know what to do. I don't find a job at all. I do not know what to do. There is no job at all, really. I do not know what to do. Electricity and gas have been cut off. It is cold and we are worried. We recommend you to consult the city office about your living conditions. I don't understand. I do not understand. This enforcer's job is to inform them of the fact that that place has been seized. Why we have to ask the city that seized our property and the government that took our land away for welfare aid? That is his job, and it is me who wait for them to come to this desk from that room that has been seized. That is all, here, so far, and I just stay calm. As an officer, I think the city if they paid municipal tax, wouldn't have to carry out a seizure forcibly. But the city, eventually, forcibly, seized all the properties they had here, and the rest is the enforcer's job. I do not understand. I do not understand. As an officer, I know, though they haven't paid municipal tax, they have managed to repay monthly the loan for building the apartment complex and the debt to the government. So we seize the place. And things like welfare aid is the enforcer's job. As an officer, they came and consulted me about things like welfare aid, I would have done my best to hear about how crucial their situation is. The officer has been waiting as the person in charge with responsibility, always sitting at his desk. And all I have to do would be to explain in detail This is the water's edge. Those who can work must work as hard as they can. Those who don't have a job must look hard for a job. At the desk, he stays quiet, calm, straining his ears. In principle, cash, savings, life insurance, cars, real estates, and other valuable items must be sold to cover your living costs. At the desk, he waits quietly, calmly, 
straining his ears to listen to our scream, our last scream. If you are eligible for systems other than welfare aid, such as pension or benefit, make use of them. Receive as much support as possible from your family, although it is not a requirement for the aid that you can't. The officer is the person in charge of the screen with responsibility at the desk calmly waits for the screen. If you cannot make your own living in spite of all these efforts, you are eligible for welfare aid. It's demolished. The house that our father built, we would run around in the garden and the little footprints are erased. Living in the loans, we watch it being demolished in front of us. It's demolished. The house that our father built, sunflowers taller than us in the small garden, withering little memories, living in the loans. We watch it being demolished in front of us. What? Are you pulling down your parents' house? It's being pulled down already? Well, you've lived here for so long. Oh. Are you pulling down your parents' house? to this apartment already? Well, you have moved. Oh? Are you selling your parents' land? If you sell it now, well, it won't make so much money. Oh? I think you look pale. Your face, well, looks really pale. Oh? Maybe none of my business, but why don't you go to the hospital? Well, because you look really pale. Well, so, right. Sure, okay. Then, though it's embarrassing to ask now, but it's kind of hard to find the right time. What? You can't go to the hospital? So, though it's embarrassing to ask now, well, so, could you please lend me a bit? What do you mean by that? Well, you can't be that strapped, oh? What about the income from the land that your decent father had and well, all the other properties, oh? Well, that's our situation. So I wonder if you could lend me a bit? Though it's embarrassing to ask now, I appreciate if you could, you know, have some money. What? Well, no, I wouldn't mind, but it feels weird to lend money to you because you're a wealthy people. We want to eat food. Oh, what? Food? But are you having trouble with food? Yes. Well, you mean you haven't eaten well? Oh? We kind of a bit hungry. Our small stomachs are empty. Well. Then, maybe for the time being. This is all I have now. So we don't need so much, though. But no, I don't have to have it back soon. Oh? We want food. We need food. Thanks. We'll do our best. There is a reason for suddenly speaking like this. Our parents said 
Happiness is not something you find somewhere around you and just get. True happiness does not exist anywhere. We are worried how you are going to spend the cold new year, so we strongly recommend you to talk to your relatives or the city office. But you can be someone who deserves happiness. What if I got happiness and look around and if I were the only one who were smiling? I might be happy, but I do not deserve happiness. That is what our parents told us, and we respected our parents. So we have long been preparing for that, only hoping that we would deserve happiness. I could not become a person who deserves happiness. I no longer deserve it. Since I was hungry, I asked the neighbor to lend me money, and she did. I have become irrelevant to happiness. There is a reason for suddenly speaking out like this. I am dead like this suddenly. And blood stays somewhere, not circulating anymore. And really, I cannot take care of my sister anymore. So I do not deserve happiness. But my sister really deserves happiness. She deserves happiness more than anyone else in the world. So I wanted her to deserve happiness on behalf of me. sister and I in this room. Nothing else. There is nothing else in this room. No. Yes. There is something. There are memories in this room. In this room, there are our memories of living here. A sofa and two cushions on it. The cushions are for holding or using as pillows. We never put them behind when sitting. In front of the sofa, there is a table, and instant coffee on it in the morning, and cheap Chile wine in the night. But it is quite good. A magazine rack behind the table, fashion magazines in it, a small TV set, a shelf under it, and a medicine box in it, an unreliable thermometer, a scissor, and a ballpoint pen a small broom for quickly brushing, crumbs of sweets, a clock and a calendar on the wall. By the way, has the new year come yet? Not yet. Has it? Well, not yet. But now in this room there is only my motionless sister and I. Nothing else. There is nothing in this room. Wait, perhaps the converse is true. There is everything in this room except I and my sister, and so there are two worlds. A world that hasn't betrayed me exists exactly as I remember, and only my sister and I are absent there. Because it's unconceivable that there is nothing we don't have anything, and there are only my sister and I in the world. Everything is reversed, and my memory is the reality. A magazine wrap beside the table, and a knitting textbook in it. A small TV set, a shelf under it, and a medicine box in it. An unreliable sticking plaster, a scissor, and a ballpoint pen. A small broom for quickly brushing crumbs of sweets, a clock, and a calendar on the wall. By the way, has the new year come yet? Not 
yet, has he? Well, not yet. So now in this room there is my memory, and we are absent. In this room I, whoa, oh, this thing in my hand, in this hand, I am in it now. I am with this sister of mine. We two are here, and that isn't all because there is one more evidence of our existence in this world. So it's not reversed after all in this fucking world. There are my, this sister of mine, I, and one more thing. There is a five yen coin in my hand, a magazine rack beside the table, and a mail order catalog in it, a small TV set, a shelf under it, and a medicine box in it, an unreliable cold medicine, a scissor and a ballpoint pen, a broom for quickly brushing crumbs of sweet, a clock and calendar on the wall. Everything is lost. By the way, has the new year come? Not yet. Has it? Well, not yet. In this room, there is my sister, I, and a five yen coin. This room is the reality. Oh, it's because I hold this five yen coin that there are the five yen coin, I and my motionless sister. So this is the only world of all things because of this five yen coin. The world can't be reversed, so there is nothing else nothing in our stomach? How come we have to be in this world where nothing is reversed and I cling to a five yen coin? After all, only the hand that holds the five yen coin tells me that I am alive. A five yen coin that is warmed by my temperature. How come the five yen coin is the only evidence of my life? My sister and I don't deserve the other world. A magazine rack beside the table. And a fortune telling book that tells nothing in it. A small TV set, a shelf under it, and a medicine box in it. An unreliable supplement, a scissor, and a ballpoint pen. A small broom for quickly brushing crumbs of sweet. A clock and calendar on the wall. Everything is taken away. By the way, has the new year come? Not yet, has it? Well, not yet. The toll. You hear that, don't you? You should somehow hear through that gap, through the draft is cold. If you turn to this direction, those go where they're to toll the bell, hold coins of hope that are also being warmed in my hands in this empty and hopeless room. If this five yen coin isn't warmed in my hand, no matter how long I keep holding it, if this five yen coin isn't warmed in my hands, no matter how tightly I keep holding it, what would that mean? Well, what would that mean? Well, now I can by myself, for myself, decide whether I'm alive or not. If I think I'm alive now, that means I'm alive. If I think I'm dead now, that means I'm dead. Nobody else can tell where I am now anymore. That's enchanting, mesmerizing. But I'll never see a doctor. If they tell, this is death, that means I let the doctor decide whether I'm alive or not. Whether I'm alive or not is something that I decide. Right now I, in this world, can decide whether I'm alive or not by myself. If I think I'm alive now, that means I'm alive. If I think I'm dead now, that means I'm dead. Nobody else can tell me what to do anymore. 
This enormity makes me suffocate. Do you still have a voice? Ah. Ah. Am I supposed to be prepared as an actor after all? Am I alive or not? That's what I decide. I am allowed to decide things about myself. I have never done that in my life. By the way, has the new year come? Not yet. So um, thank you, first of all, again, to the actors and uh, for Soraya to, to grapple with that text. It's a very significant one. I think uh, you know, there's an old tradition of question what's life and what's not alive, what's a ghost, who's alive, come back. So it's a, a play that, of course, deals uh, universally with themes of theater in it all. Jan Kot, the famous uh, Polish writer, always said theater is actually between the living and the dead. It's that fine space, often characters are portrayed, they're already dead, they don't live anymore, but now here also we are in that zone. And um, so first of all, uh, play to you, um, is that, uh, have you seen the 
version in English uh, on the stage? This is the first time I'm seeing it in English. How does it feel and uh, to see your work? So this is an English to see it to you koto to doji ni sono watashi igai no hito ga enshitsu o shiteiru jouen っていうのも見るのが初めてっていうことでまあ自分の作品がいつまでもまあもちろん大事な作品ではあるけれども自分から離れる瞬間離れた瞬間の喜びを感じることができました。So today,、uh, this is not only the first time I've experienced hearing my play in English, but it's also the first time that someone else besides me has、uh, directed my work. So、um, I'm right now feeling the, the experience of joy and having my work extend beyond me. Hello. 僕はどちらかというと演出の仕事の方が日頃多くてえっとだから劇作家としての評価は今回して評価していただけたことをとても嬉しく思ってるんですけど今回は自分が書いたっていうよりもあもうあの姉妹に姉妹に書かされたっていう印象が自分の中にあるんですね。Um, I actually work more often as a director,、um, so to be acknowledged in this way as a playwright is、um, a great honor. But、um, this particular play, I feel like、um, rather than me having written it, I feel like I was made to write it by the two sisters. ですので、まあ、いつまでたっても自分のものっていう感じではなくて、多くの人にこの。姉妹がどういうふうにどういうことで亡くなったかっていうことをしていただくためにもいろんな方に、えー、と触れていただき上演していただくっていうことはあのいいことだろうと常々思ってました。And I've always felt that、um, I would love to have、um, more people hear the story of these two sisters and so to have somebody else Directed and, the, and thereby reaching more audience members, I think that, that's wonderful. Tell us a bit about the story of the two sisters. Yes, I think it's a story of the two sisters. So, this was an incident that happened、um, in an apartment complex in the suburbs north of Osaka, not Tokyo, but Osaka. So,、uh, in January 8th of 2011, the bodies of these two women were found. で、えー、まあ警察が入って調べたところおそらく推定死亡時刻が2010年の12月の22日か23日あたりだろうということが、まあ、あの調べによって明らかになりました。Um, and the, the police department were the first to find the bodies, and、um, after some investigation, they determined that they probably、uh, passed away、um, in 2010, December on 22nd or 23rd. Yes. And then, the time to use 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 the 実際に彼女たちが亡くなったマンションを僕は見に行ったんですね。Uh, so initially my thought was to just take that time frame and portray you know what might have occurred during that time frame、um, but then、um, I actually went to visit this、uh, apartment complex where, where this took place。そうするとそのマンションはまあそういった事件があったっていうことをまあ、熱心にインターネットで調べれば分かるんですけど、まあ、そういうことを知らない人たちがもう普通に暮らしているそれはもう風化されていくであろうっていうことがもう,もうそのマンションを見てもう分かってこれは彼女たちの,その亡くなる時間だけじゃなくてやっぱりそこに至った経済的事情行政の
問題とかもきちんとあのクリアにし,して作品の中でしていかないといけないなと思いました。Um, and once I got there,、um, you know, on the internet, if I, if I searched really、uh, deeply, I could find information about、um, this area and this apartment complex. But once I actually went there, I saw very quickly that there were pe- people living there that had no idea what had happened, and that as time went on,、um, This incident would just begin to disappear and dissipate.、Um, so I thought that it was really important to kind of portray also the economic realities of,、uh, and the environment、uh, and the circumstances of this whole、uh, living situation. I'm a little bit of a とはいえあのさっきも言ったようにその年を越す時間を書くためにそこに、えー、と多くの時間をこの上演では作品では割いてるんですけど彼女たちが幼い頃っていうのはやっぱりあの少しセリフにありますようにご両親が随分のお金持ちでたくさんの土地を持ってて豊かな暮らしをしていたそうです。Um, so, as you saw in the play, the, the time frame is this, this、uh, New Year's Eve into New Year's Day.、Um, but I also wanted to、uh, make a point of、uh, communicating that the background of these women, that their parents were quite well off. っていう部分もありますし、えー、と同時にこれは日本で上演した時に何人かのお客さんに指摘されたんですけど単純に彼女たちが資産運用についての知識がな,かなさすぎるんじゃないかっていうような意見もありました。So, from one perspective,、um, you could say that these women were raised to be very、uh, pure of heart. Um, but another way of looking at it, and, and several audience members in Japan、uh, made the comment that they just knew too little about the realities of how life worked and how money worked. So, this is it. まあ、実際も資産運用が失敗したとしてもそのまあ作品の中にもありますように市役所の窓口に行けば生活保護をもらえたのかもしれないんですけどやっぱり彼女たちが幼い頃にこう裕福な生活をしていたっていうことがまあ心の美し,た美しさといえばいい響きですけど悪い言い方をすればプライドがあったゆえに。そうその窓口に行くっていうことを恥に感じてたのかもしれないっていう部分はあります。So you know it, as portrayed in the play, there there is the the city office, the welfare office, and had they gotten themselves to that front desk, they may have been able to you know get into the welfare system and 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 received、um, financial Um, aid, but because of the purity of heart、um, that they grew up in, or perhaps it was their pride、um, that prevented them from being able to get themselves there. So, I think that the people who are in the world are in the world, and the people who are in the world are in the world. So, I mean, something else that I found in my research, but I, I feel like for them to have had to ask for money to feed themselves must have taken a huge、uh, amount of、um, just swallowing one's pride. Do you feel it's a microcosm of a Japan society or a Japanese? Feeling of, 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 of the zeitgeist of, of, of Japan today? Um, so, 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 希薄の反応とか、いろんな意見を伺ううちに、その声が積み重なっていくうちに、ずいぶん日本の状況を
特にまあ、えー、とバブルがはじけた後っていうの日本っていう状況を象徴している出来事だったんだなというふうには思いますというのもあのあるあいいですか Um, when I initially wrote the piece,、um, I wasn't thinking of it in those terms, but after having received a lot of feedback from audiences, I, I do think that it is symbolic, emblematic of what has happened to Japan, especially post、uh, bubble. あの先ほども言いましたように、この事件が2011年の1月8日に発見されたというか。発覚した事件だったんですけれども、まあ、あの今日この場に来られているような方はご存知かと思いますがあの東日本大震災がその後2011年の3月11日に起きて、まあ、そのニュースに全てのニュースがさらわれたような状況でその事件のことは忘れ去られてしまってるんじゃないかって僕はちょっと思ったんですけどただある程度年いってて。つまり、えー、と実際亡くな島が亡くなったのは60前半ぐらいの姉妹なんですけれどもそのニュースのことをこの作品を見て思い出した方がすごくたくさんいたのを覚えています。Incident was Know that、um, March 11, 2011 was, of course, the great earthquake and everything that happened、um, after that. So, in a way, I feel like the news cycle was so focused on that earthquake and the aftermath that <coughs> excuse me, this incident was quickly forgotten. So, there were a lot of people in the audience who came to see the show and then were made to recall, oh, yeah, this, this happened, I remember this now. だから皆さん、日本人の多くの人の心の奥底にずいぶん突き刺さった事件だったんだろうというふうに思います。So it became clear to me that it was an incident that actually had a, a deep effect on a lot of Japanese people at that time. Almost like a quiet, private earthquake and that nobody heard it because no one was there. Uh, maybe um, let's move to the actors um, first. Um, how did it feel?、Uh, how, did you, um, how did you approach that,、um, that, that work? Julie?、Um, I think,、uh, Julie?、Uh, there was something about the repetition of certain words and certain lines that.、Um, Uh, I think uh, uh, kind of revealed maybe the in internal、um, turmoil.、Um, and I know that Soraya wanted、uh, to have a kind of physicality、uh, to the text.、Um, and uh, uh, so I think、um, uh, it, it almost felt like. In my sister and our space, you know, we had this small square as our home that the thoughts were、um, uh, kind of underneath a lid.、Um, and so the, the release of I'm playing the dead body, <laughs>、um, but、uh, the reason I kept, I kept my lines were I have a reason to speak, I have a reason to speak. And so I think、um, June was capturing、um, uh, the cry, you know, almost like a silent cry of this dead body. But everything is contained and private and.、Uh, yeah. Just one more thing, because it's a part of Japanese culture, you know, to save face and not to really reveal if you're suffering,、um, everything kind of had a mask in front of it.、Uh, I was intrigued by the challenge of playing a bureaucrat,、uh, particularly after watching Kirsten Nielsen a lot,、um, especially back in June. Um, when she was defending、uh, the administration's policy of family separation. Like, how, how do people live with terrible news or terrible actions?、Um, I still don't know if I've discovered that, but it's a really intriguing thing to, to try to explore.、Um, 
Also, after I said yes to doing this reading with all these lovely people, um, my own father died on October 28th. And so that actually made me a lot more curious about the borderline. I got to witness a little bit of it with my dad in the ICU, and it's definitely something that I believe belongs very much to theater. It's one of our kind of sacred missions to explore the, the borderline and the difference between, which is, I think, quite thin. Yeah, and that, that line between private, very private lives and then the state or the, the city officials and where they intersect and by, by the letters. Um, Soraya, um, tell us a little bit, how did you approach the text? Uh, but you read it first and um, um, what, was your, what was your strategy? Um, well, f I read it first, and uh, for me, what struck me the most was the poetry of it. And the images that came out, the visual images that came out. And um, I watched uh, uh, Jun's uh, direction of uh, Sokonazu uh, in Japanese, and I watched the video. And I was very influenced by the template of that. Um, and um, that gave it a form. And then the personality, the characters, when I spoke to June, he said each character has a different physicality, separate different physicality. And so I had such wonderful actors that each of them physicalized it, it in their own way and brought that to it. It's kind of like the process of the play is kind of like a metaphor of, to me, of um, life in a way, because it was like, uh, <laughs> like you have the lines, you have the play, and then uh, you have the movement, so which is the shell, and then you have the actors, which are the soul and the spirit of the life of the shell, and then the words come out. It's like it's like what we are, like our different our different uh, spheres of who we are, like our physical body, our bliss body, our soul body, and then and then it comes alive in some ways, you know. Yeah, I think you you beautifully captured the, these kind of silences. Or what you said, the silent cries. You heard the whispers of their voices and the coin, you know, then falling on the floor. Um, um, any other comment, maybe from the actors before we go to audience questions or something to share? Yeah. It, it was such a um, wonderful experience. First, with the piece that June wrote, and then with the space that Soraya created. Um, I found it difficult to engage with some of the work because uh, I'd long been a fan of Japanese culture and I'd seen it, um, at least the way it's often depicted in, in our society, as a, a land of decadence. So for me personally, I had to re-engage and challenge my own ideas of what Japanese culture and society mean. Um, and, 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 uh, and for that to exist in alongside scarcity and, um, and, and that kind of work. So, but um, I had a minimal role in, in, in the play, but these actors and our director and your work um, really was strong enough and, uh, and, and the space was beautiful to, to, to come and um, interpret it. Thank you, thank you, oh. really a great ensemble. And I like also that Soraya gave the actors around uh, um, the two, the sisters, you know, a, a space, yeah. I just want to say that the text itself uh, inspired a lot of. Uh, you felt it already that it was, mo there was like movement, silence, and text. It's very particular where you, you know, like where you, how you moved, where you moved, because it would change the whole story. And sometimes it was so. Un it's uh, and to be comfortable in the uncomfortability, it's uncomfortable, and uh, and the process is uncomfortable, but that. That's like something that we had to all trust. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
So, <clears throat> so maybe Michael, and thanks again for all what you guys do up there, and a little bit of light to the audience, and we open up for questions or comments. Um, and, and what do you have maybe say, show you who you are with your name, and then um, something that you would like to. Hi, uh, my name is Natasha um, from Australia, so it's very exciting um, to see this. Um, I, I had a question for, for Jun. Um, it's really interesting. So, Raya, you're talking about the, um, I suppose the value of silence. I think it is just as important, uh, or if not more important, than the, the dialogue and the piece. And I was very interested in how Jun approached structuring that piece, because it's a very kind of non-traditional structure. And I, I think um, it makes the piece so unique, um, such a unique way of delivering and exploring that event. And I was wondering um, how, how you developed the, that structure. うん。えっと、まずこの作品を作るにあたって、その死に至るプロセスを表現する、うん、してる先人として、えっと、ベケットのことを考えました。um, so the, my first thought um, in tackling or uh, approaching writing this piece is that uh, since I was trying to express um, the process of dying, um, I immediately went to uh, Beckett. Beckett,その劇曲ではなくて小説の方で、その螺旋を描くようにし。um, so, and not, I wasn't um, looking at Beckett's plays, but actually his, his novels, and there's a way um, it works that's a kind of a spiraling inward structure.今この時間って舞台上で行われている時間を今というふうに捉えずに少し幅のある時間として幅のあるものを眺めているっていうふうなことを感じてもらうためにリフレインを使ったんですね。And um, one of you mentioned the repetition of the text. Um, I was using that as a device to create the space on stage in which the present moment was not just the present moment, but that there was a window of time that could open up um, on stage. So the, when you look at the script itself, um, it's just a, a sequence of phrases that are lined up kind of one after another. So それはあの、全もう沈黙を多く作るっていうことが前提になってるテキストになってまして、えっと、今日はえっと一応上位時間50分ぐらいかと思うんですけど、実際は2時間近くあのテキストでやってるんですね。um, and so that way of representing text on the page was, is meant to hold a lot of silence. Um, today's reading, I think, took um, about 50 minutes, but um, in my production, it took uh, about two hours for the whole play. So that, that it took that much time to um, deliver the text very slowly. And it takes much more time to rehearse to make it longer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So they did an amazing time. But other comments or thoughts? Questions? Yeah, could you? Uh, Mr. June says that uh, he commented that the failure or the whatever happened to these two sisters was because of their good heart. Uh, my question is that uh, is it customary that 
the parents to do not educate the children to whatever they pass on to the children, how to cope with uh, whatever they receive or in the, they inherit it. Is it a customary that they just leave it up to the children to figure out or they do not educate the children in order how to handle whatever they receive or what is the, what is the, uh, and also the, and whatever happened to these uh, two sisters, was it their pride that they, they couldn't handle or, uh, they, or they, they didn't like the failure and I just want to know the idea and the mentality of the the, the culture of uh, uh, of the Japanese, how they could avoid uh, such a uh, moments that happened to these two sisters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John. そこ、あの、とても良い質問だと思うんですね。その姉妹にとって、その、うんと、学習っていうのがなかったことを、えっと、お客さんが、それが悪かったんじゃないかっていう指摘をする。されあの、でも um, so I think that's a really, really good question. Um, I, I did hear uh, comments from the audience um, when I presented my performance that, you know, it's, it's the fault of the sisters for not having educated themselves as to how to deal with financial matters. But um, I also heard... Uh, in comments that almost escaped me that, um, well, in situations where your parents, both parents, pass away very suddenly and very unexpectedly and there was no time to kind of pass on those wishes or instructions. Um, and I, I'm just remembering a comment that I neglected to translate earlier that contextualizes that these two sisters were in their 60s. Just FYI. So in, in answer to your question, culturally, generally in Japan, um, you know, people who have reached a, a certain age and have a certain amount of uh, material wealth and children who they're going to eventually pass their wealth onto, they will um, conventionally tell them, like, this is what we're looking at, this is what we're dealing with, this is what to expect and, and what to, to do with that. So maybe one last comment or question, a fast one. If not, um, then um, we go ahead. We also have to, uh, in the next half hour, we have to set up for the next uh, reading. Thank you all, truly, for coming and saying, I hope you can make it. And um, thank you. What a beautiful, uh, beautiful text. And thank you, the actors, Soraya and uh, June, for coming here. Thank you.